Well, hello everybody and welcome back to Sports Week Day 2. We have a very special guest with us here today, a good friend of mine as well. Um, I've known JC as long as I've been in the industry on the marketing team. We've traveled together, many trade shows, events, um, and JC is a really amazing commercial photographer. He's got a lot of great portrait work, but he also has a lot of great sports portraits works that work that he's done um, in the past, including the Mets. And um, he has a great portrait of Serena Williams that I just saw on his website, which I was like shocked to see. Um, and he's done basketball players. I mean, I could go on. Um, and he's also really just well, well versed in lighting and has a great understanding of how to use light as a light as a tool in photography. Um, so I'm really looking forward. I always learn a lot from his presentations, really looking forward to having him on here today. I'm going to let him take the stage. And as always, you guys can type your questions in the chat. I will interrupt JC politely during his presentation. JC, as long as that's cool with you. Sure. Awesome. So please do type your questions in the chat and um, we'll give the floor over to JC. All right, I'm just sharing the screen. You guys can see that, right? Do we yep. get it? Okay, awesome. So hi everybody. Uh, thanks for taking some time out of your afternoon to be here with me. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Joseph Carey, conveniently works out to JC, so everybody calls me. I do work at Westcott, and um, I'm going to be talking about Westcott stuff, but I just want you to know that this is a lighting class that's Westcott-centric, not a Westcott class that's lighting-centric. So the majority of the stuff that I talk about in this class, you guys can do with just about any lights, but of course, I do think our stuff's better. So with that being said, this is Dynamic Sports Images. Uh, presented by me and Westcott, and I want to thank b &H for hosting this event. I think it's really cool. I got to watch the things yesterday, and if you guys saw Alexis, then um, you really don't need to watch me because Alexis's work is fantastic, but I'm joking, sort of. I mean, no, not about his work, but I hope that you still can get something good from me. So that's me. That's how you can get me. Um, jcarry at fjwestcott.com. There is my Instagram, jcphotomedia, and there's my website. If you uh, have a question that we don't get to, or if you have some questions about Westcott gear, please feel free to hit me up at any of those places, preferably the email, and I will get back to you. And I'll answer your questions and, you know, help you out as much as you can, as I can. So many of you probably recognize me from my first career as a male model. You know, I was featured in Super Bowl commercials and you know, I really found that life of being a male model unfulfilling, so I decided to work more on being a photographer. And I'm going to assume that you're laughing or that you think that I'm amusing. Although if you've seen me before, you've heard that joke and it's not as funny now. I've been blessed over the last bunch of years to shoot some of the best people and athletes doing what they do best. It, it's not my specialty per se, but I do love shooting sports. It's awesome. But what I love more than anything is light. I love lighting. Um, I'm a big fan of, you know, when people tell me that they're, available light shooters. I'm like, well, strobes are available. I am a little bit of a control freak when it comes to that end, which I think is why I love concerts and I love sports is because I am out of control with that. But whenever I can, I want to bring the light with me because that way, whether the light is great or not, I can, uh, I can control it. So back a while back, I was a person who was definitely scared of flash. Like I think a lot of photographers are when they first get into photography. And then I met this witch and she brought me this child. And that's what taught me what real fear was. And after that, it was like, all right, let's, uh, there's nothing to be scared of with some lights. So I'm going to get out the commercial portion of this first. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I carry, what I bring with me. And throughout all the pictures in this presentation, you'll see these items pop up. I do use the FJ wireless flash system. I've been with Westcott for just about a year now, but I'm happy to say that I've used Westcott stuff far longer than that. Some of the modifiers that I have are now going on being 15 years old. And so when the opportunity came to join Westcott, I was like, yeah, I'm all in because I'd already been using the products. I already believed in their products. 
over the last year and a half, we've gone from being a company that was primarily modifiers and constant lights also into being a strobe company. Um, our middle, you know, our, our entry level, I guess it's not entry level in that it is in skill in what it can do, but in it price point is the FJ80. It's our round headed speed light. It's multi-brand camera compatible. So if you're somebody that shoots Nikon and Fuji or Sony and uh, Lumix or Canon and Olympus or any of those combinations, if you have our speed light, it works on all of them. Sony's needed an adapter. It's about $19. Sony uses a really advanced or different hot shoe that requires that. And that only is required if you want to do high-speed sync or TTL. But other than that, our our flashes and strobe system will work with whatever camera you have. So if you are a teacher, an educator, if you're somebody that works with multiple systems, if you're you know somebody who is thinking about switching, which I see more than ever, if you use our lights, you're not going to be stuck for another expensive remote or have to change out all your strobes or your, your flashes. One step up from that is the FJ200. So the 80 has 80 watt seconds, the 200 has two, 200 watt seconds. They're really convenient. It's got an industry leading 1.3 second recycle time, which is really great. It's uh, half a second faster than our nearest competition. 450 full power flashes. And what it's what's really important, the 80, the 200, and the 400 that I'm about to show you, they all have constant, consistent light quality. The color stays the same from shot to shot, from light to light, from product to product. All of our stuff is compact, portable, performance-driven. Um, the 400 and the 200 are both AC-DC, meaning they can be powered by battery or off of a plug. You know, and that's, you know, really everything that I always wanted in a system. You know, I came up doing a lot of speed light stuff. And now that I have these that are, you know, my, my 200 especially is about the same size as a speed light. And I'm getting the power of three and a half speed lights. You know, two and a half, three and a half, depends on which brand you have. The 400 for something that's as small as it is, is giving me enough power to over enough to overpower the sun. It's got a built-in modeling lamp. And most importantly, all of our stuff has got USA based support. You know, all of our repairs, our customer support is based in Ohio. And then we have the FGX 2M again, multi-brand one, you know, one remote to rule them all, so to speak, uh, definitely has made my life as an educator easier. You know, when I'm out teaching classes, rather than having three or four different types of remotes for different brands, I'm able to just use one, pass it around, and everybody can use it. It's really great. All right. So this is one of the new items into my bag. Really excited about it, especially for our 200 and our 80. Both of those lights have a quarter 20 onto them, and our quick mount bracket, which we've seen this type of thing in the past, but I'm going to tell you, I think ours is a little bit better. It's got three cold shoes around the outside, so you can put speed lights all the way around if you use an umbrella. And you don't see a screw at the top because it's not it's not how it's, it's held in. I know you guys can't see my mouse, but if you look to the one that is to the version of this picture that's all opened up, you can see a little quick release plate that goes into the quarter 20 on your 200 or 80 light. It slides in, no pressure on the head, and it's really a nice feeling piece. Why do I use that? So that I can use our Bowens mount light uh, modifiers on my 200 and my 80. The 400 is already a Bowens mount. The quick boxes is a system of, of soft boxes that we have that range from everything from a beauty dish all the way up to an octa large. And the cool thing about it is even if you're not invested in our lights, we have a insert for every single brand that's out there, essentially. Like, I can't think of one that's out there that people use that we don't have an insert for. So if you're somebody who's using us and Dynalites or us and Profoto or us and you know anything that's out there, Pulsey Buff, wh whatever you're using, you can put the same softbox on you know on everything, or you can just get different rings. The Apollos I talked about extensively. Anybody who's seen me knows that the Apollo Orb, especially, was something that was kind of my gateway into Westcott. You know, the first one I got was about 15 years ago, and, you know, I still carry one all the time. It's great quality of light, can be used with hot lights, can be used with strobes, can be used with speed lights. I love them. 
Our mini boom arm is a, is a really useful piece of kit to drop in. It's more than capable of holding up an FJ400 and obviously anything smaller. So that's given me a lot of flexibility. And if you look through this, you'll see that in some of the pictures. And then umbrellas. You know, we've been making umbrellas since 1899. You know, Westcott started out as an umbrella company, then in 1969 morphed into being a photo company. But we've always made umbrellas. And basically, whichever kind you want, whichever size you want, we have one for you. All right. That's the commercial. So let's get to the to the learning. Let's get to the fun, what you guys are hopefully here for. Um, so I know a lot of people feel like this when they start talking about adding strobes, about adding in any kind of light into their pictures. And I understand this feeling because I was also that person who was a little bit uh, intimidated by lights, whether it was speed lights and TTL or not knowing what to do with manual it was intimidating and finally after making millions of mistakes which i'll get to in a second you know i feel a lot better about it and i think that i have a system that i can teach just about anybody that might not make you a world-class lighting person but will definitely take the fear away from the flash and so you can end up feeling like this instead i don't know if gabe's around or if he's on but you know gabe's a B&H fixture and like one of the, the really great guys in the industry, but that's just, that's a classic game picture. So why should we add lights? You know, if I was doing this class live or if we were doing this with, you know, you guys able to interact, I'd wait for you. We'd talk about it a little bit, but at the end of the day, I use lights because I want to control the light in my picture. Cause what, what is photography of not painting with light? Right? So when I take my camera, and I put it in aperture priority, let's say, it tries to tell me if this is a correctly exposed picture. You know, it's because they're correctly exposed and I was on them. But I'm a photographer. I want to be somebody who makes photos, not just takes photos. And so when I see a sky that can be like that by underexposing it, I go, all right, well, how can I fix that? Well, I can fix that by adding a light. There's that Apollo I was talking to you guys about. And this is two speed lights. And, you know, two speed lights and a little bit of modifier and we end up here. And that is why I add lights. That's the reason, the only reason. Um, so why? Because of creativity. If the ambient light bores me, if the ambient light doesn't give me what I want, the story that I want to tell, then I'm going to add lights. And it's never been easier to do it than it is right now. Based on cost, based on simplicity of setup, based on wireless controls, based on the fact that our cameras can, you know, give us an instant result, it's never been easier to learn how to light. So why not do that? Well, when you say why add light, a lot of people tell you, oh, because you, know, you need extra light, but amount is like the least important thing to me at this point, because our cameras are so good. I can turn the ISO up and get more light. That's not really gonna help me tell my story usually. It's direction, it's hardness, it's color. Where are the lights coming from? How hard it is? What color is it? How does it interact? Where does it tell me to look? Those are all things that are going to really help me as a photographer because I'm very rarely going to be with the person who sees the picture. So I need them to look at it and go, hey, this is what he wanted me to see. This is what he was wanted me to look at. Amount is definitely a part of it, but it's my least important part of it. When I talk about direction, what am I talking about? Where the light comes from? If I make it mostly in the front, it's going to get rid of all the shadows. It's going to be glamorous, but it's not going to be very realistic. Very rarely do we have light that's coming straight at us in the real world. You know, we're more likely to have light coming from a side or whatever. And for me, creatively, I do, I do tend to put my lights a little bit more at angles because I like contrast. I like shadows. I like, you know, the dimensionality that, that gives me. It's not always the, the way that it has to go because there's, you know, you got to be able to tell the story that you need told. Backlight is a really important tool to use. It's something I'm really going to use by itself, obviously, but, you know, it's really can separate you from the background. If I didn't have this hair light up here, you know, you would, I'd just be blending into the dark background behind me. Being able to add that light is going to give you a lot of separation. Uplight is something I very rarely use. It's called monster lighting for a lot of places, but it does have a place if I'm trying to make my viewer uncomfortable. We're not used to seeing light come from the ground. When we talk about soft versus hard light, you know, I find myself a lot of the time, especially for my sports stuff, going towards harder light. 
I'm not going to say hard light. This picture on the right there is an extreme example, bare light, small light source. The one on the left is an extreme example of really close up giant light source, getting rid of almost all the shadows. Somewhere in the middle of these is where I generally live, unless the story that I'm telling calls for that. So how do we get soft light? The location and the size of the light source dictate the softness. Bigger light sources close to a subject give you soft light. Small light sources are almost always going to give you harder light. But if you have a subject that's very small and a small light source, you can get soft light. So the size of the light source in relation to the size of your subject is how you get soft light. Now, if you move that same giant light source far back, it's going to get hard. So just remember that. So when you buy your modifiers or when you're thinking about how to set up your shot, always be thinking about what you want your end result to be. Do you want to get rid of the shadows? Do you want to accentuate the shadows? The picture on the right, I wanted as many shadows as I can. All those wrinkles are really shadows that we're seeing in between the folds. They help tell the story with that gentleman. The one on the left, I just wanted to get rid of all that. I wanted it super soft. I wanted to focus on her eyes. You know, I didn't really want any detail anywhere else in the shot. Remember this, you know, if you have failed at something for one time or for a hundred times or for years, you know, it don't quit. You know, I mean, I know that's easier said than done, but you're going to take a lot of bad pictures on your path to making some great pictures. And remember, always just keep it simple. If things start to get overcomplicated, step back, break it down to the one light and just go, hey, I can make a good picture here and I have a lot of control when it's one light. I, I've seen a lot of younger photographers or newer photographers start to try to get overcomplicated right away before they've actually really mastered even using one light. So if there's something that you're going to you know, really try and you're going, hey, I've always been a little scared of lights, but I want to get out and do something. Start with one. Don't start with two. Don't start with three. Don't start with four. Just because somebody's telling you all about the basic three light setup or whatever, you know, don't worry about that until you've mastered what you can do with one light. Remember this, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Bring the lights with you, shoot, shoot, shoot. Make mistakes, that's okay, but revel in the failure. Look at your XF data later on, figure out what you did right, what you did wrong, how to bring the mistakes and turn them into successes and how to avoid the ones that are just bad mistakes. And the last thing is pre-visualization. Pre-visualization is, to me, just as important now as it was before we had mirrorless cameras that kind of show us what we're going to get before we shoot because they don't really take into account what a strobe is going to do. Pre-visualization is the ability to look at a scene, kind of lick your finger, put it in the air and go, hey, this is going to be 2.8 at 4,000th of a second. And how do you get to that point? You get to that point the same way that you do when you're shooting landscapes or you're shooting anything else by paying attention to what went right and what went wrong in certain, civil, in certain situations. This applies indoors in the studio or outside. Just having a basic recipe list in your head of go-tos is always useful. And then going using those go-tos as a place to jump off and become more creative is always great. And that's the, really going to be the gist of my whole way that I set up my lights is I use a very, very precise you know, system that allows me to riff off on that and like really try to get creative after. This is a, something that I... I I'm not going to say that I'm the first person that ever said this, but I know that I'd never heard somebody else say it when it came into my head. Every lit image is two separate exposures. And if, as soon as you get that into your head, whether you're using speed lights or strobes or constant lights, once you figure out that the light that you are controlling, the light that you're adding with you know, a strobe or a speed light, and the light that you can only control with your camera are two separate exposures inside the same picture, the sooner shooting is going to become so much simpler so here's this example wake up get out there for sunrise what was on the other side wasn't good you know yeah i could have easily made a nice picture with the sunrise on the model's face but that wasn't the shot that i wanted i really wanted that orange there was better clouds on this side there was better trees for whatever reason i'm going to pick the spot why should i not have the choice to make the picture i want to make so I'm at ISO 64, I'm at 5.6, I'm at 250th of a second. That gave me the sky that I wanted. Now I got to add some light. And by adding just, this is just one light, added it on there, and it's two totally different exposures.
you know, here's a, a even more graphic example of this, you know, so a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine, we were shooting this guy, just built this bike, you know, pretty much from the ground up. And at F8, at a 40th of a second, they were telling, the camera's telling me that I'm exposed correctly on him, on, on my main subject. Now, I don't like the way the sky looks, because first off, I can see what the sky looks like with my, with my eyes. But then I also, in my head, because I've been pre-visualizing for so long, know that if I underexpose it, I'm going to get a much more dynamic sky. And I like dynamic. I'll be the first to say, as you guys look through this, a lot of my pictures look very flashy. Um, there are, you know, Alexis yesterday did a lot of stuff where he's really looking to simulate real light. And I think his work is fantastic. It's beautiful. That doesn't mean that that's the only way. I could do that when I'm shooting a wedding or I'm doing something like that. But for my portraits like this, my action type stuff, my extreme stuff, I want to go real crunchy, real flashy. So I underexposed that shot. So I went from 1 40th of a second down to 2 50th of a second. And that's what the sky looks like there. Didn't change the aperture. You know, that was part of my process. Now I'm going to add the lights. And when I add the lights, you know, we end up here, you know, because now I've got two separate exposures going on. I've got the exposure that I control that's going on to my subject. And I've got the exposure that my camera's shutter speed control. So that's going to bring us into process. Now, for me, lens selection is always going to be the first part of my process. And when I'm talking about lens selection, I'm not talking about brand or, you know, zoom or how fast the aperture is necessarily, although that's a part of it. But lens selection is going to be such an important part in informing the rest of the discussion for me that I have to always start there. I know that sounds simple, but I think a lot of people take for granted that focal length has such a big part to play in the rest of the picture. And what do I mean by that? You know, I'm going to start with a failure. Remember Revel and failure? New York City skyline, Brooklyn Bridge in the background. I got a 1635. I think I'm going to make a cool picture simulating sunset and i take the picture and it's it, it's not it's not good didn't work i'm at f4 with a 16 to 35 i'm somewhere around 20 millimeters on the shot brooklyn bridge is a sharp background is sharp i can see the verizon building but the brooklyn bridge is tiny because i used a wide lens it's not very flattering to my model the way the light was didn't work nothing works so i'm going to change lenses you know, I could have changed a lot of other things, but for me, I knew that none of the other things that I could change was going to give me a better photo of what I was thinking in my head. So instead, I stepped back, changed the light around a little bit. Again, there's my Apollo, which I told you I love. I go to the 105. Now, the important part, thing that you really need to see here, besides the fact that this is a better picture of the subject, is that I was at F4, and at F4, the Brooklyn Bridge was tiny, but sharp. Here, because I went to 105, it's now compressed. I've totally changed the way that the scene is seen, but I had to go all the way down to F10 to get the Brooklyn Bridge even this sharp. You know, in a perfect world, you know, I might've even went down to like F16. The problem then is you start to get fraction, you know, the picture gets less sharp. So I just want you to remember which lens you pick is gonna have a great effect on your aperture. And why is that important? Well, because for me, aperture is my first creative decision that I make. Lens choice, ISO, all of that are things that sometimes are not going to be able to be chosen by me because it's going to depend where I am. But aperture for me is there to control my depth of field. You'll hear people say, oh, well, aperture controls the flash, you know, how much power it's going to get. And that's true. But if I change aperture in order to control how much flash power is getting to my subject, then I have changed my depth of field. And I don't know why I should do that when I can use modifiers, I can use you know power settings on my flash. Why would I do it that way? And I hear, I've heard people say it that way for years and years and years. And I'm, look, everybody's got a system that works for them. But for me, I'm just gonna pick an aperture based on how much depth of field I want. How much of the picture, how much of the background do I wanna be sharp? always remembering how much importance lens choice has in that in that whole process. A 20 millimeter at 2.8 gives me tons of depth of field. Andy sharp, the plane sharp, background sharp. You know, if you zoomed in far enough, you could read the writing on the buildings in the back. Everything is except is at least understandable in these pictures, right? You know, I can make out all the writing on the on the plane. 
it's all part of the story. I need that to be sharp to let people know where we're at. But now if you go with a longer lens at that same 2.8, you know, we're gonna see this picture again later, I think. Um, when I talk a little bit more about this as another example, but this is a 105 at 2.8, and now depth of field is completely different. So that's why I'm gonna start with lens choice and then go to aperture. Because the aperture, you, I hear far too many, especially young photographers think, I got a 1.4 lens, I'm gonna get this really creamy bokeh. And I'm like, well, it depends on how close you are to your subject, it depends on what focal length it is, it depends on a lot of other things. So just take that in whenever you're shooting. And we're gonna show some examples and I'm gonna talk about that as we go. Next is shutter speed. Shutter speed controls the ambient light in any situation. This is an extreme, extreme example of this. This picture here, and you're gonna see where I shot this in a second, is, uh, all right, I messed that up. I'm sorry guys, so that was at 1 1 60th of a second. You'll see that information in a second. This is that room. You know, so I, I was in Florida to help out Mets photographer, shooting some portraits. And then they were like, hey, uh, do you have some stuff with you? Do you want to shoot some portraits? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to shoot some portraits. But we had no backdrop. We had, you know, not a lot of room. So I, and they were like, you know, we want you to do that, what you do. You know, we, we want you to, you know, we've already got a really great, you know, set up at F8 with three lights and all that. Make it a little bit more, um, you know, dynamic is the word that they used. And I end up using it. I think it, it's an overused word these days in photography. So I went with a pretty you know, wide open aperture, get really shallow depth of field. One fifteenth of a second here is the reading for this room in a correct exposure, where the picture that we end up with at one one sixtieth of a second at 1.6, I've picked an aperture. Now I've picked a shutter speed and the shutter speed is there to control the ambient light. In this case, to basically eliminate it. I'm using, in this case, two speed lights, one up top, aim down at his hat to get some separation. I've got a one by three rapid box strip over to camera left, which is the main light. And I've got a, a Westcott reflector on the right side to give me a little bit of light coming over to fill that in. There we go, sorry about that guys. Uh, brand new presentation for you guys. So I should have worked that out. But that bare speed light above gives me the hair light, keeps it, him from separating. I've also used a, uh, I think we ended up using a towel, you know, over to the side to work as a flag, you know, because I just didn't have everything with me. But I did have a couple of speed lights, I did have a couple of mods, and was able to make this set of pictures for the Mets, which all worked out pretty well. They ended up using them, it was my first time shooting the Mets, which led to them inviting me back to do some other stuff. And then the last step is to add the light, you know. I know that that sounds really trite. I know it sounds really simple, but if I, as a photographer, have controlled the things that I can totally control, my photo, my, my focal length, my aperture, my depth of field, my shutter speed, which controls my ambient light, that gives me a lot more freedom to be creative when I decide to add the, the, the artificial lights. You know, in this case, I'm at 2.2, depth of field wasn't terribly important to me. This space, it's an abandoned building, is very dark. 500th of a second meant that at 2.2, at 500th of a second, it was pretty much a dark frame if I, if I didn't have the lights added in. So all the light that's in this picture, I'm adding. I've got two Apollo orbs, one to camera left is my main light, one way over to camera right, which is just filling in some of that graffiti, you know, and filling in the side of our face a little bit, but leaving some shadows, which give a lot of depth. So let's sum that up. Aperture controls the depth of field, shutter controls the ambient light, and then you add the light. That's my whole process. And I think that if you talk to enough people, eventually you'll find out that that's the process for a lot of people. They just don't necessarily word it the same way. And for me, as somebody who was young and trying to figure this out when I, when I was first figuring this out, inexperienced, you know, if somebody just told me that right up front, I'm not saying I'd be like, wonderful, but I, I'd probably be further along because this really breaks it down to building a, a really solid skeleton and allowing me to flesh it out with adding what light, what modifiers, what, what do I want to do to be more creative? I see so many people want to jump right in with gels and different mods and all this stuff, and they don't have a place to start. So here we go. This is the process part two, where I repeat myself a bunch, show some examples, 
we're going to talk about some other stuff in a couple of minutes. This is my friend Terry. Uh, this was my first ice hockey, you know, shot, which led to some other ones. If you look at me, you'll definitely see that I ended up shooting a fair amount of hockey portraits this year. Uh, the ironic part is I can't skate. I, don't, I hate the cold, but I was up for this challenge of trying to do this. So Terry invited me over to the rink that he's a coach at there. And I was like, all right, so I got a couple of strips and just going to keep it simple. You know, I could have went three, four or five lights, but for multiple reasons, I didn't do that. Uh, one of which was that I was scared to fall down with my camera just about every time I took a step. And we end up with something nice and clean like that. That's, that's good. That's a great starting point. For me, I'm always going to start with that starting point and then try to work towards making something that's more dynamic. Depth of field here, you know, aperture, I'm shooting relatively wide open because the rink itself is not important. I'm shooting at a faster shutter speed in this picture, again, because the rink this, the, isn't that important. This really, I want this to be just about Terry. Got those two FJ400s, just the two 1x4 strips. I love strip lights, especially when I'm shooting athletic portraits. They are very, you know, a strip light, when I say that, just for the people that don't know, is any softbox that is longer than it is wide. You know, there's we make a 1x2, a 1x3, a 1x4. You know, there are other ones out there that are even longer. But for me, the 1x4 allows me to go head to toe. You know, it gives me just a little bit of fall off, which I like a lot of the times in my pictures. But it gives me something, you know, a great amount of light that's very controlled, especially when you add some grids. This is the Octa Large. This is my friend uh, Vinny. He's a he's a Muay Thai fighter. He's a trainer. He trains other fighters. This is over on the west side. You know, two point five depth of field. I'm shooting with a relatively wide lens here. I've got a thirty five millimeter, so I know that even at two five, I'm still going to totally be able to make out where we are. Anybody who's been over there knows where I am right away. If not, you just see that there's something interesting in the background. It doesn't need to be sharp. If I stop down. It's not going to make it a worse picture, but I also didn't think it was going to make it a better picture. So 2.5 was good enough. One sixteen hundredth of a second is what gave me a little bit of detail in the sky. It wasn't the greatest sky. It was a little bit overcast, a little bit flat. But sixteen hundredth of a second is underexposed, but not so underexposed that that stuff that's in the, that's in the background becomes a silhouette. Uh, you know, if I had had more time, we were up against, he had another person come to the train. You know, maybe I play with that shot to see what a silhouette's going to look like. This is one FJ400 in a rapid box Octa L. I love the Octa L. It's uh, it's just really soft, big light source. But when I make it more directional, I'm still able to get some shadows and definition. Direction comes plays a giant part in almost all of these at these portraits that I'm doing of athletes because I want depth. I want a sense of 3Dness, so to speak three-dimensionality. So this is from this year's spring training, which was a, a very interesting experience. I'm going to talk kind of fast because we've got some stuff to get through and I definitely want to get through it before my time runs out. So when I went down this year for spring training because of COVID protocols and everything else, it went back and forth. You know, I I got tested, all this, and then they were like, you still can't go within 15 feet of the players. I'm like, oh, Okay. And they were like, we just really want you to shoot against a gray backdrop so we can easily cut the players out of the background and use them for all kinds of graphics. And I was like, all right. But in my heart, I knew that in the past, the Mets had responded really well to the more dramatic pictures. So I was like, I'm going to set up two setups on this one little soundstage that I can shoot at the same settings, same power on my flashes. Um, Power might be a little bit different on the flashes, but the same shutter speed and same aperture. Because as I switch back and forth, I don't want to have to be making any differences because I got to do this quick. There's going to be about 50 players coming through in just about an hour, maybe even a little less. You know, it ended up being longer. But when they first told me, I was like, have to do this really quick. So the main setup is that white background, which is really gray. It's overexposed by the iPhone. It's got a one by four, a one by four on camera left, camera right. And I've got the seven foot umbrella up there. And why am I doing this really safe, really not terribly JC light setup? 
is because the batters could be left-handed or right-handed. So I need a light on either side of them when they turn. And that seven foot umbrella put as low as I can is going to be very forgiving. It's going to, not going to be the most dynamic light. It's not going to be the most exciting light. But the challenge here is that I've got players that go from 5'5 five, five up to 6'8, six, 6'9. Six, I can't go near them, so I can't change the light in between. So this has to be as safe as possible, which also led to what I've got going on on the right side of that frame, which is a 1x3 with an FJ200, an Octa L with one more FJ400, and my F X drop black with 5x7. I put that there, and so after I shoot the gray backdrop, I say, can you just step over here, give me two poses, bang, bang, shoot those pictures. As usually happens, like, yeah, they're using a ton of the pictures from the background that's light, but they also really loved, and the players loved, the pictures that are on the right. And that's important when you want to get asked back. Being able to do multiple things really quickly is great. So what I did was I had all the stuff on left on channel 12, all the stuff on channel right on channel 13 on my FJX2M, that meant as the players walked over, all I had to do was change that and nothing else, just take the shot. So this is the gray background. You know, ISO 100, 105 millimeter, 200 of a second, F4. Super clean, super easy. You know, I would have lit the background and went to a white background, but they were concerned with the white uniforms. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. It's your, your guys, what you want. But then th these were the pictures that, you know, I was able to shoot on that X drop just a couple of feet to the side. A lot more dynamic and, you know, to me interesting, but, you know, I love them both at the end of the day. But I was able to do that really quickly with our system because from the remote, I could change power if I needed to, but I didn't have to. When you're shooting fitness stuff, a lot of times, a lot of gyms, unless you're in a big gym, can be very tight spaces, and that can be challenging. That can be intimidating to get in there. I'm going to tell you I'm six foot five, and the lights that are in the middle of that were just about hitting my head. You know, this is a, it's a low basement dungeon. There was really no ambient light. The ambient lights that were in there were completely different temperatures, so I just turned them all off, and we went completely with light from my FJs. So you see I've got the two one by fours again, love them. And then I've also got a beauty dish that's in this for this behind the scenes is hung upside down, but I'm not going to use it in this first picture. This first picture is just off those one by fours. And this is one of those where I didn't love the background. So I'm like, all right, let me shoot from a severe angle, highlight, you know, the muscles, highlight the size, really make it really gritty and dimensional. But then let's also be able to turn on the other light, that one that you see hanging down to the floor, to light up the, the guy. Now, I know that I told you at the beginning that I don't like uh, uplight, but in this case, it worked. You know, I had it close enough to him that I'm not throwing shadows. I, I shot around the ceiling. I opened up the shutter speed a little bit to get a little bit of background because that white separated him from the background. Here's another one of those where I'm using a softbox, but I'm not using the softbox because I need soft, soft light. Caroline's got great skin. What I want is to highlight those those shadows that make up her six pack. So I've moved it far away from her, even though I'm using a softbox to make the light softer. I'm still going to take it back and make it so that it's somewhat hard, and but it's still directional. So I know where the light's going. The light's going to go over Caroline from the side, hard to camera left. I've got her looking that way. I'm at sixteen hundred of a second at one eight. It's very clear this is New York City or at least a city. Um, you know, the hot dog, I, that's a New York city hot dog truck to me. Like if I see that New York city, right. But once I've set that shot up and I've made that picture, never be scared to ask your subject to do something more, something ridiculous. Sometimes it's going to work out. Sometimes it's not, you know, in this case, I've stopped down a little bit because I needed to have a little bit of more faith that I was going to be in focus because she was going to be moving. 400 of a second gave me about the same exposure for the, the city, so they're pretty consistent. What I changed now is the power on the flash. I'm, I'm going to turn up the power of the flash, but the rest of this exposure is going to stay about the same. Again, this is in here just to talk about focal length and how much of a big deal it is when it comes to you know, aperture selection, which then leads to exposure and the whole thing. 
500 millimeter lens at f11 i've still got very shallow depth of field i had to line these two kids up on the same line put their heads really like you know on the same plane to make sure that they were sharp if you look at the trees and everything else in the background and if you really got to zoom in on this picture you'd actually see that neither tire is tack sharp because their faces are you know just one umbrella shoot through right out to the side of them that light coming from the side kind of simulates maybe a sunset but you know what i was just really looking for was some dimensionality now switching out to a 20 millimeter lens a couple of minutes later i'm at a five and everything is sharp from the front tire to the cars that are on the road in the back you know it's all acceptable you know you you zoom in if you had enough resolution you'd be able to see all that i'm always going to start with aperture because aperture informs shutter speed shutter speed informs how much light do i need to add to the whole picture you've seen a lot of pictures in here that are high speed synced pictures which means that my flashes are going to reduce power so i got to put them even closer so that's why i go through all the rest of that stuff before i set up a light before i even think about where i'm going to put the lights i need to know how much depth of field how much shutter speed is going to be needed to get the background picture after that i can start getting creative if you try to set up your lights first and then make every one of your other settings fit what you decide to do with that light setup you're going to be frustrated almost all the time so this is uh i got lucky I was uh, invited over by the ufc guys to uh, the first ufc event in new york city conor mcgregor's there you know at the time was definitely the biggest star in ufc had the 105 1.4, which is like one of my favorite Nikon lenses ever. I'm not shooting that anymore, but I love that lens. F2 gave me a very shallow depth of field. It was, wasn't really interested in much else. One by four strips left and right. 53 inch deep umbrella is behind me. It's going wide enough. I just needed to fill in a little bit. What I really wanted were those, those edge lights to really provide separation. You see it on his head. You see it on the belt you see it on his arms really makes a lot you know this is a pretty i love this picture but great so i told you we'd see these before so if you're going to shoot outside one of the key things is to you can never be sure what mother nature is going to throw at you but you got to scout it out as much as you can i was out in denver for summit workshops um definitely great set of workshops if you're interested in hands-on sports and lighting the lighting workshop or the sports workshop at summit definitely check them out we were there shooting lacrosse. We'd been in Denver for a few days, and I noticed that every day at around seven o'clock, the clouds came in. Every day during three, four o'clock, they were like this. You know, it was just blue sky. And I was like, all right, well, this is a fine picture. There's nothing wrong with it. Two, five, eight hundredth of a second, eight thousandth of a second. There's nothing in the background that's interesting to me. You know, it's just power lines and lights and stuff. I'm like, all right, this isn't fun. If it was nighttime and those lights were on in the background, then maybe we got something to play with. But I knew in my head that I was I had already set this up. I was going to leave it there because I wanted to get this guy. I thought he had a great face. And I was like, hey, come back over to me two hours later when I knew that the sky was going to come in. I still shot very shallow depth of field because it wasn't a key to me. But it made the picture look a lot more hero-y, you know, superstar picture. Really separated him out, made it into a different picture. Now in the studio everything that we've been talking about still comes into play you know how much depth of field okay how much shutter speed in this case if i'm shooting against a black background i usually want a shutter speed that's going to give me a completely black frame before i add the lights because every picture is two separate exposures right so if i can get rid of all the ambient light in my picture and make a frame that's completely black then i know that when i add light i should still have a black background there's some caveats to that it's going to depend a lot on what modifiers i use so when i'm using in this case a couple of rapid boxes and a beauty dish everything is gridded the grids are those you know kind of like egg crate but they're there to keep the light directional as much as possible i don't want the light spilling all to the background luckily for the next like i had plenty of space so even at 105 millimeters i was able to get them seven or eight feet away from the background which lets that go black i don't have to worry about it if i had less room like i had with the those mets pictures in that locker room then you got to flag things which flags are where you can sh you put something between the light and your background to keep it from lighting the background it's something to definitely think about as you get more advanced but remember keep it simple to start now you've heard me over and over go pick an aperture and then pick a shutter speed 
That doesn't mean pick an aperture and stay with that aperture all day. Just remember that when you change your aperture, it's a universal change. So if you wanted to go to 1.4, you'd have to go to a thousandth of a second to get the same exposure. If you wanted to go, you know, to f8, you know, we'd have to go down to a sixtieth of a second or a fiftieth of a second, you know, to get the same exposure. All right, so that's important. Now, again, when you've got somebody in front of you and you build a little bit of rapport, the first thing to do is get the pictures you want. But never be scared to say, "Hey, give me your, give me your war face, give me, you know, give me something." Having everybody having the picture where the guy is standing there, everybody's going to get that. Don't ever be scared with your athletes to get them to show some emotion, to show some personality. You know, even if it's not their real personality, you know, what's important is to get them to show something. So you've got a picture that maybe not everybody has. The other thing that I found is that if there's alternate uniforms around, if there's alternate, you know, this was at Nick's Media Day and they had these sweatshirts that everybody had. And I was like, yo, can you put that on? It wasn't part of the day, but I think it made for a better picture or at least a more interesting picture that not everybody had. You know, I was at Indy and we got our hands on some of the younger racers who are always looking for cool stuff. You know, I wasn't necessarily going to get a full-blown indie car racer you know to come out but they do have some some lower circuits reached out it was like hey you know, are you interested in coming out stopping down even though i'm at 105 millimeters i stopped all the way down to 63 i say all the way down because i wanted some of that background to be part of this picture it doesn't have to just be about the athlete all the time this is not an athlete picture, but it displays a couple of really important things that we've been talking about. When we were talking about softness and we're talking about inverse square law. So this is an F2 picture. I gotta hurry up right now. You know what, I'm gonna skip this one. Okay, guys. Outside, went to there. I, I got some things that I want you guys to see. All right, so don't be scared once you've got a light set up to change it around a little bit. You know, just to, to try to get some different, different looks out of the same setup. So in this case, I got a three light setup going on. Cap softbox has got the is my main light. I've got a bare light on the other side, and you've got that light hanging upside down, which is there primarily to light the snow that this guy that Lucas keeps kicking in my face. So first shot is like that. All the lights are on, and I really liked it. But like I said, we're living in a golden age right now for lighting. So by going to my FGX2M, I was able to take group A, which is the softbox, turn it off. And then take this picture you know just no other change other than just turning off one of the lights and that's an important thing like once you get something take the extra shot change up some things change your aperture to, but go this is a section i'm unfortunately gonna have to go through pretty quick but the speed of light flash duration and using it to stop action is something that's really important to at least grasp that the flash duration, how long it takes the flash to go from being off to at its full power to back off is an important thing to know about because it can stop action. Here we go. You see, you know, if I, sh I'm only shooting these at 200 of a second, that's not enough to freeze all those raindrops. But my flash, which in this case is down at power like one, is going off around 19,000th of a second. So it's freezing the raindrops. Any softness that you get here is because this was the first time I tried this, and it's because I'm shooting at 2.5. If I was stopping this down, you'd be able to see every individual drop even better. You know, Here's an example where I was able to overcome not the right environment to do this. You really want the darkest environment possible, but I was taking advantage of the 400th of a second that my A1 can do at normal sync to get more power. I've got four lights all around them. And in that setup, we ended up with this picture, uh, which was a lot of fun to do. Again, it's the strobes which are freezing the light. The ambient light that's in that picture because it was too bright outside is what's making the stuff that's farther away from the bat start to look like it's moving. Here's another one of these. You know, This is my friend Keith. He is pumping his legs really fast. But the room is totally dark except for those blue LEDs that are around, which give a cool look. I would have gelled it this way if I would have thought about it, you know, because it looks really great. But at a third of a second, his legs are moving, but his his upper body, which is mostly still, is going to be mostly sharp because the flash duration 
is so quick. Here's another one of those examples, F20, 200 of a second during the day. It was much brighter than this, but I'm throwing a bunch of light at that guy as he comes around the turn in order to freeze that. Here I'm with a 600 millimeter lens, so I know that the wheel motion is not going to be something, so I can shoot this fast. <laughs> Bless you. Hi, Irene. Bless you. <laughs> Bikes. I'm going to go through this guy's a little fast because we got about three minutes, I think. This is one of, I really love this one. This is in a turn. I'm shooting this at a 25th of a second. We have FJ400 with a gridded reflector. A friend of mine is holding it and aiming it into the middle. I'm, I'd be lying to you if I said that I tracked this guy throughout the shot. He, you know, he's got number 700 on the front. He's not one of the stars. But I knew that if I just aimed at this certain point and pre-focused and kept myself at 25th and just kind of just kept panning a little bit with it, that I could do something like this, where all the people that are not in the strobe are showing a ton of motion. They're showing the motion that I'd get at a 25th of a second at F16 moving my my camera but he gets frozen because the pop of light is going straight at him it, it make, it's a very interesting concept i recommend making sure that you're allowed to use strobes at any event before you decide to break them out um, we got permission to use them at this event which was cool here's here's gabe again and although this is not an athletic picture this is in here just to show the breaking the rule so every other time i've told you guys start with aperture in this case, I had to start with shutter speed because the shutter speed was the most important part of this frame. I could control everything else later on. By starting with the shutter speed and working out that four seconds gave us a proper amount of sparks coming off of that, I knew that my strobe would freeze Gabe even though it was four seconds. The flash duration is going to freeze him into the picture, and he's going to be solid. Aperture is then used just to control the ambient light so that the fire in the background doesn't overflow that. This next picture is even a more extreme version of this. This is all one picture, 10 seconds, two lights, two strobes, one to camera left, one to camera right, both gridded soft boxes. You know, here we go. Totally dark room, 10 seconds. In slow motion, this is my friend Mark Kettenhofen. We put some glow sticks onto the stick. Uh, Nikon ambassador Dave Black is the one who taught me this process. But he was doing it, making really pretty pictures of this pro golfer we had. But my favorite golfer? It's Happy Gilmore. So I asked Mark to give me a Happy Gilmore swing, take a couple of steps into it. Strobe goes off, both strobes. We get light on both sides of him. You can see there's mostly in the middle picture, you can see he's lit on both sides. On the left and on the right, it just is, it comes off as a much more directional light. All right, guys. That cuts it. We I did it right on time. Sorry I had to go so fast there at the end. There's me again. If you have questions about the gear, about techniques, about anything, hit me up. jcarry at fjwestcott.com. There's my Instagram. I just want to say thank you all for being here. I hope that uh, some people were listening and I didn't totally embarrass myself. Thank you so much, JC. That was great. I, I got out a lot out of that. I'm glad. I think the, the, you know what really helps me are the lighting diagrams. It's really nice to be able to see everything written out and like the tech, you know, the specs all written out beside it. So that was really helpful. Yeah. I mean, so just a note on that, you know, because I, 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 people ask for that and that's why I put it in all my exit data. And I wish I had more behind the scenes pictures, but part of the challenge with that is that when you're actually shooting to stop and say, hey, hey hold on, everybody. I'm going to get some behind the scenes as an old right. But the exif data is is a great starting point. I just want to make sure because I've had people hit me up in the past going, well, I tried shooting it at 2.8 at 4,000 of a second. It doesn't look anything like your picture. What's important to remember is that that's why I have the process is start with the aperture, which is going to control how much light's coming into the overall thing, then the shutter speed to control the ambient light. If your ambient light's totally different than my ambient light, your picture's going to look totally different. And that's just the key, really, to remember there. But thank you, Maddie. Awesome. Are you okay with people sending you a message if they have any other questions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, yeah. Awesome. So we're going to pop uh, your Instagram and your website in the chat so people can reach out. I also do want to remind everybody that if you do have a technical question, you can email 
BH shows at bhphoto.com. And that email will go to one of my, my, either myself or one of my teammates. And we'll get back to you usually within 24 hours or so, except if it's Chavez. Um, I do want to take a second to uh, wrap up by going over some of the Westcott deals that include some of the great products that JC spoke about. So if it's cool with you, I'm going to share my screen here. Awesome. So everything is outlined here on the Westcott website, although all of these deals are live now on the B&H website as well. This is just a really good place where all the information is centralized. Um, here's that X-drop wrinkle resistant backdrop that JC was speaking about. This is a great product that I myself have used before. Um, a lot of people will come up to me in the field and ask me about, you know, getting seamless, seamlesses getting wrinkled and that sort of thing and getting dirty. This, you can literally throw it in your washing machine and it, the way the backdrop is set up, it's really just taut straight across so that there's none of that wrinkle or, um, sort of dirt that you would see on a regular paper seamless. Also the FJ200 strobe is on here, but on the B&H website here, I'm just gonna move this down. Um, we have a free uh, soft box listed the 28 by 28 with that item. So that is one of the deals. Um, also one of the modifiers that JC spoke about several times. Yep. So. Um, make sure you go check out those deals on our site. And again, follow JC on Instagram. Thank you again for coming on. We're going to take a short break. I think we have about four minutes or so until we have our next guest, Irene Gee. Um, so everybody, I'm going to sign off here. Thanks again, JC. And we'll see you guys back in four minutes or so. Awesome. Thank you.